I will talk about management in software development. Um, I will we, I will use uh, terms leader and manager interchangeably, and when I use these terms, I will um, think of roles such as product manager, project manager, or a team lead, because those are typically the the roles that developers work with daily. Before we move on, uh, I'd like to ask you. Uh, how many of you are currently in some kind of a management role or at least part-time or, or full-time? Please raise your hands. Plenty of you, I've, <laughs> I would say. And how many of you don't have yet any management experience but uh, would like to gain some in the near future? All right, awesome. So this talk is primarily intended for, for the developers to help them understand their managers and to help them interact with them more easily. But also it will provide some good leadership practices so it will also be useful for, for the people that either are in management or, or hope to be in management roles soon. So first, a little bit of my background so, so, you, that, so that you understand where I'm coming from and why am I topping, talking about this topic today. Uh, for the first three years of my career, I've worked as a Java developer, Java Enterprise Edition. Uh, some projects were uh, government projects, some projects were uh, big commercial global projects. And then uh, after, the, after the first three years, I moved to front-end. I did a lot of JavaScript, some mobile web, mobile apps, hybrid mobile apps, desktop web, things like that, and some Python and Django aside. And uh, throughout the years, uh, I've worked at, in different kind of environments. Some of them were uh, like a corporate big environment. So some of them are small startup, startup environments. Teams were ranging from a two to three person teams all the way up to 15 or 20 person teams. And with years, more often, I would get some kind of a team lead slash project management role. And then three years ago, I joined Shavdam for the first year. I worked as a software developer full time, and then I moved to started to lead the, the whole team for the last two years. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is how my uh, workday changed in this transition. So as a developer, uh, my workday was highly focused. I would be working on a task sometimes for days, and my days would be would be planned. My work would be planned for days, if not weeks. And I would, um, I would pretty much code all, almost the whole time. Um, when I moved to management, my days uh, changed a lot. So they were a lot more dynamic. Um, instead of having concentrated chunks of work, uh, I have a continuous flow of quick interactions, context switching, and problem solving. Uh, questions and interruptions are coming my way all day, every day, from within the team and from outside uh, the team from the other departments. Um, so from my experience, uh, management role is much more dynamic and I, I'd say even chaotic in comparison to the development role. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about is how my perspective has changed in this transition. So as a developer, I would look at code almost the whole day, um, and I would either do, uh, write the code or code review some other code or just learn from other people's code. And uh, the biggest pain points were things like uh, slow unit tests or duplicated logic or even inefficient code um, and global variables and hacks like that. Uh, and I, I thought that the quality of the code was the main concern of our business. And I would constantly feel like uh, if we don't rewrite this whole thing, uh, we will, the business will fail because the quality of the code is the most important thing for our business to, to thrive. And when I moved to management, my view of the business changed a lot and my pers perspective changed a lot. So first of all, I... I now see a lot more challenges than I, I saw before. I see the challenges of our developers in our team, but I also see a lot more challenges coming from outside of our team, from the rest of the company. And um, 
some things that drive me nuts before, um, I became numb to them now because there's a lot more issues and problems, problems that I'm facing. So, and don't make, get me wrong, I still think that uh, unit testing and refactoring are very important, but I also realize uh, the importance of things like uh, project planning or progress reports, documentation, and even things like um, quick response time to customer inquiries. And some of, those, some of those things are important for the development team to function well and to scale, but some of them are also important for other departments to do their job well. Um, there is, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to this, but uh, I, just one more thing I wanted to say. So, um, my perspective is much wider now, my view is much wider. I see a lot more things, but I also see a lot less details. Um, and for me as a, as a former, or I, I believe still a developer, um, it's sometimes hard to realize that I don't understand my developers anymore as I could two years ago. And I don't see their daily pain, and, and I pretty much forgot how daily development works looks like. The other thing, there's another way that my perspective has changed. So as a developer, I would see our manager as a superhero with superpowers, and I would believe that whatever problems we had, he could solve it if he just wanted to, but for some reason he didn't want to. Um, and I would be frustrated like uh, with, with some, um, I, would, I would ask questions like, um, why don't we have better tools to work with? Why don't we buy this software that helps help us to be more efficient? Um, why are we constantly changing priorities? Uh, why don't we implement this cool feature that I just thought of? And I would be frustrated by uh, decisions that were made above me by, by our manager that I didn't understand why they are as they are. Um, and even later on, when I, when I started to manage the team, I was still frustrated by, uh, by things, by decisions that our CEO made and some things that we gave priority to that I didn't understand why and they didn't make sense to me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but with time, I realized that manager is not a superhero. He doesn't have any super special powers. The only thing he can do is assign resources to challenges, and those resources are, are always limited. So there is always a lot more challenges to face than there are resources to assign to them. And for all the levels of management in the company, from a team lead level all the way up to the CEO, there are, for, for all of them, the same thing applies. There are a lot of more challenges than resources. And, and to highlight that thought, I'd say that uh, with each level of management, uh, your power increases by a factor of two, but the weight, the volume, and the diversity of issues that you face uh, increases like tenfold. And especially for a CEO who is on the top of everything, uh, be sure that he's dealing with things that nobody else does. Um, I've personally never been a CEO, so I can't say how it feels, but I've learned to respect that role with time, and um, if you're more interested in the perspective of a CEO, I'd like to su uh, suggest a book that's named The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, who is a famous investor in Silicon Valley, and the book really provides a deep insight into a role of CEO, at least in a tech company. <coughs> Pardon, sorry. <laughs> this should be the right way. <laughs> So, from my experience, here are some things that I believe make a world-class developer, and none of them are related to the technical jobs. So, the first thing, I think it's very important for the developer to be able to analyze requirements and provide constructive feedback. And I would compare that to, to the math assignments that you might remember from school, where you first read an assignment, and then you write all the information that the assignment provides, in a form of mathematical expressions, and then when you make sure that you have everything, then you start solving the, the, the assignment. So the same thing should be with software development too. Uh, when you get to your requirements, you need to make sure that they are uh, full, that you have everything that you need, that there, are, that there are no open questions, 
if there, if there is something missing, you should ask for clarifi clarification. You should also make sure that the, uh, that the requirements make sense in the technical and in the functional context of the product that the feature is being added to. And if something uh, is wrong or doesn't make sense, you should say that and communicate that back to the person that gives you the requirements. Um, the second thing is estimates. Uh, to be able to estimate reliably is very important in a business because a lot of business decisions are made based on estimates. And there is a lot of information uh, out there about how to provide good estimates, so I don't, I don't want to go into that. But um, I just want to highlight why they are important. And they're important because our existing customers are asking about issues that are affecting their business, our bugs. And we need to, our support team needs to be able to provide some information when, when those bugs are going to be fixed. Our sales people are talking to our uh, potential customers, and they are asking about features that we might not have yet, and they are in development, but our competitors have them. And their decision to buy our software will uh, be based on, on when something will be released. Uh, our marketing team needs to uh, plan their activities according to the estimates when something is going to be live. And also product management needs to create some schedules and roadmap and assign priorities to features based on when they can be developed and released. One other thing is shipping. So the world-class developer needs to be able to ship. Uh, I personally believe that the job of a developer is not to produce high quality code, it's a little bit more than that. So besides that, you also need to provide or actually um, produce and deploy functional software to your customer. Only then you're providing a real value. So what that means is um, assuming that you already did a good job with the sp uh, specification and with the implementation, you should also make sure that, that the software that you've written is tested well. Don't just test the best case scenario. Test the good, test the bad, test the ugly. If you can, write automated tests. If you can't, do it manually. Um, if you created a bigger feature uh, that is uh, like a, a new thing that will be sold and marketed, always offer to do a demo for the company because other departments will be interested in how that feature works and how they can market it or sell it or even understand it for the support team to be able to support the product. Um, if you, whenever you create a new feature, a new functionality in the software, you should also uh, as, uh, either offer to create documentation that covers it or at least assist in creating it. Be organized, which means be aware of your task log, be aware of things that are in, in your queue that you need to do, and be aware of the estimates that are assigned to these tasks, because only then you can raise alarms when there is much more work coming your way than, than you are able to, to handle. And that's very important information for your manager to be able to reschedule or, or to assign to somebody else the task that was intended for you. Be an effective communicator. So whenever you can, try to communicate asynchronously whenever the issue is not uh, important or, uh, sorry, not urgent. Try to communicate asynchronously because you don't want to uh, stop people at, at their work. You don't want to break their focus. You don't want to break their concentration. Um, when you need help, always provide context first. First, So communicate what you are working on, what is the problem that you are dealing with, and um, be actionable. And be, be specific about what kind of uh, help do you need to, to fin to, for the, from, from the other person to be able to help you. Uh, when you write emails, make them short, use simple uh, sentences, use bullets, and make them actionable, meaning also that the other person receiving them knows what is the action required and from whom. Uh, I forgot a few other things. So th two important things, and they're both related to the management role. So first thing, whenever you're working on something that was not planned, was not scheduled and arranged with your manager, let him know. And also, whenever you're behind a schedule, for whatever reason, communicate that back to the manager 
because it is very important for, for him to have that information to do his job of making sure that the most important things are handled in a timely manner. Be the person that offers solutions and who takes action. And I hear sometimes people say, uh, they, they kid around about their boss telling them, I don't want problems, I want solutions. Uh, but it's not about avoiding problems. It's about if you have a problem and if it's not way out of your domain or responsibility, when you communicate that problem, always try to come up with a solution or at least approach to how to solve them, that, that problem and then communicate that alongside the problem itself. Don't be the person that, that goes around and whines all day but doesn't ever do anything to fix anything. Um, so after we've covered the, the great developers, let's talk a little bit about great leaders. What makes a great leader? So first thing, communication. Communication is very important and the leader needs to be the communication bridge between the team and the rest of the company. He also needs to be the communication bridge within the team between different persons, di different people in the team. Uh, he needs to bring in information from the other departments and from the rest of the company and share that information with the teammates and communicate the importance of these challenges and also successes and for the challenges why it's important for the development team to help the, the rest of the company to tackle them. Also, development manager needs to bring the information out of the team to the rest of the company, whoever is interested, and make them understand why the issues of the development team are important for them and why it's important for them to fix them. <coughs> Great leaders need to be people that will uh, drive consensus and, and move things forward. What that means is, first of all, leaders should be able to, to provide support and information required for the development team to do their job well. He should also promote, promote a culture of uh, making informed decisions and failing fast and learning from failures. Whenever, whenever there is a disagreement, about different approaches or solutions to a given problem. He should be the one that helps reach an agreement. And whenever he, he's the one that should uh, make tough decisions when the team is not either powerful enough or courageous enough to make them. The leader should set high bar for quality of work, meaning he should communicate the expectations and of course set them and then communicate them well and also make sure that, that good practices are followed uh, and communicate why they're important. The leader should be the coach of the team. He shouldn't be the one saying, you do this and you do that. The coach is a person who, when, when a team member comes to him uh, with a problem, the coach is one that helps the team member to come up with his own solution. Uh, so the default mode for probably all, all managers is to leap it into a solution mode and just provide solutions for their team members. And that's something that I'm personally also struggling with because it's so very easy to offer solutions when you have a lot of things on your plate and you don't have time, but that doesn't leave any room for growth. So it's important to, to spend some time on coaching people and helping them solve their own problems. And assuming that some of you are now excited about the leadership roles, uh, at least those of you that don't have the management experience yet. Uh, here are a couple of uh, tips from my own experience which could help you to get into management roles. First of all, be interested, which means uh, be interested in what your teammates are working on, be interested in what, in what happens outside, outside of your team in the other depart departments, and what, what are the challenges that other departments are facing. And then reach out to help. Help to uh, offer to help your teammates, offer to help your manager, offer to help other people in other departments. And be careful because it's very easy to do that wrong. Uh, and that's also something I struggle with because I would um, read something uh, online, an article about marketing or uh, management or uh, support, and it, it would seem so easy. 
and then I would get back to the company and talk about that to the rest to the, to the guys in the company, and they would get defensive, and it just wouldn't work. So don't be aggressive, be humble, and be respectful. Always try to understand first, ask a lot of questions, and then when you, when you have a good feeling of what the problems these people are facing, only then offer solutions. And also make sure when you offer solutions, the offer to be a part of that solution. Because otherwise, it will often happen that you turn out to be a guy that just goes around and tells other people how to do their job, and you don't want to do that. And lastly, when your solution, your suggestion is rejected, uh, don't get offended and don't argue. Just move on or try, to try another way. And if you follow some of these tips, I'm sure that uh, whenever a leadership role, role opens up in your company, that you will be a natural person that people will think of. So that's pretty much all for today. Um, thank you for your time. I hope you have some questions. Please ask them. If you don't, uh, don't have time to, to ask them now, you can reach me during the conference or some of these contacts on the slides. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. OK, we have time for five minutes. That's still two questions. Please raise your hand. You will need microphone because we are recording this. Hi. You said that when you were a developer, you saw your manager as a superhero. Yeah. What are you doing now when you are manager so that your developers don't see you that way? <laughs> um. I just tell them that I can't fix the problems they think I can. <laughs> Simple as that. So I just say, I can't, I can't do anything about it. We have limited resources, and these are all the challenges that we have. And we just need to, to focus and choose a few of them, or one of them, and then focus to solve them. And we can solve them all at the same time. Okay. Any more questions? We have time. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, how, do you, how do you set priorities on different is issues for developers, for designers, for uh, support team? How do you, how do you uh, know what is critical for the project, what, is, um, what needs to be done uh, in a small amount of time, and uh, what needs to be done, what can be done later? What, what is the ev evaluation technique? Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty difficult question to, to answer because the, the solution is pretty complex and it depends on the situation. So for bugs, usually it depends on, um, we have like a criteria of how many customers that issue affects, how often does it happen, um, what are the importance of the customers, because we have some bigger customers and some smaller cu customers, and bigger customers, of course, pay a lot more money. So if some issue is specific to bigger customer, we're still gonna probably uh, give it a higher priority, uh, although it doesn't affect a lot of customers. Uh, that's for issues. And for the features, well, I'd say it depends on the amount, amount of inquiries we get about them. And um, I don't know, we, we just try to, we try to set some fixed timelines about new features. We just want, don't want to develop something new for, for six months. We say, okay, let's see what we can uh, bring out in like a month or three months, three months, and then then we decide what what of those features or parts of the feature seem to be most um, most effective or most valuable to our customers. We talk we talk about customers sometimes. We show them uh, wireframes or try to explain the solution how it will work, and they, then they give us feedback about it, does that solve their problem or not. There are all kinds of approaches depending on the different issues that we have. Hi. Hi. Uh, in your experience, how often did it happen that either the estimates uh, you provided or you got were reliable? Were what? Sorry. Time estimates to do something. How reliable, in your experience, they are? Reliable? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't understand the word. Reliable, well, it depends on the person <laughs> who's providing them. Uh, but with time, you can learn some people uh, are less reliable, some people are more reliable. Um, 
I don't think that re when I say reliable estimates, I don't really think that you need to be uh, specific, like this will take two days and four hours. It's more of, a, uh, of some level of estimate. So when I ask for estimates, at least the ballpark estimates, I don't ask for you need to, uh, what, what amount of hours you need. I would ask something like, do you need a day? Do you need a week? Do you need a month or do you need three months? And then depending on that, usually some decisions are made. And then the, like, uh, the specific estimates in amount of hours are more, um, more used later on when the project is ongoing and we just want to track how much time we spent, um, how much time was estimated and how much time we spent on the, on the feature just to have a feeling of how wrong we were, where we were wrong, how we can uh, make the estimates more reliable for the future.